And the custom of the churches that I grew up, we usually exchange an Easter greeting. I think we do it here. So if I say, He is risen, you say? He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And we still are in the season of Easter. And there are seven seasons of Easter. So that's going to be a theme, the theme of new life and resurrection. So it might happen again that if I say, He is risen, you'll respond, who knows? So just watch for that during the sermon because I might keep you on your toes. Now, there actually was uh, a person, you know, because we're all just kind of, whatever culture you're in, even if you're not uh, a member of the church, you kind of get with the program. So if the custom is, in fact, to say those words, which I won't repeat so you don't have to say the response again, that people automatically do it. But one time I said those words, da 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 da. Okay, I'll say, He is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And someone just kind of groaned inside and went, oh. The first time, not the third time I asked them, but the first time I asked them. And I thought, what an honest groan that was. <laughs> you know? Because it was a feeling of, you know, I really am not sure I want to be here. And they're making me do stuff and say stuff. I'm not sure I believe. And, and I thought, yeah, you know, that and I could tell. I couldn't pick out the voice because I know that I was going to know who did that. But, but you could tell that it kind of made people shift uncomfortably. And, you know, that, that's too bad because I think that this is a Sunday exactly for the groaners. You know, the, the people who are having a hard time sorting what all this means. It's kind of a shame that it's, and there's this big letdown after Easter. Everybody feels it. The, the congregation feels it. The, the choir, the, the, the people who got all the Easter stuff rather, ready, whether it be food or flowers or decoration. And the pastor felt like he had to hit a home run because so many more people were there. And then the Sunday after Easter comes... And I guess they gave the sermon to the other guy. <laughs> to do it. But you know, in, in the in the uh, Great Britain, this this Sunday is called Low Sunday because it is one of those Sundays where things are kind of low. Generally, I don't want to stereotype congregations, but generally, attendance is lower Sunday after Easter than it is on Easter Sunday. Is that true here? Yeah, I mean. That's no indictment, but you know what? I, I, I think that, that those of you who do, do show up, uh, I'm going to broadly put you in two categories. Uh, people who believe the story, and people who maybe are saying, okay, that was great Easter Sunday, but what about Easter Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? In other words, is it really true? Is it really true? I believe, you know, it says in the Gospels, one guy says to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's a great phrase. I love that phrase because it deals with the, the tension between faith and doubt. That there's, that there's somehow twin sisters or brothers. They're somehow together. They, they go together. They're, they're in a tension always in this life, and they don't necessarily have to be solved. I believe, but help my unbelief. And then here we have Doubting Thomas. I love Doubting Thomas. You know, when, when I've had uh, spiritual profiles in my life uh, done, they, they broadly pick out a biblical character. They, you might be like Moses. You might be like Peter. You might be like Mary. You might be like Martha. And they do have a Doubting Thomas category, and I absolutely fit the Doubting Thomas category. So this is my Sunday to shine. Maybe. Because I love Doubting Thomas. Because he's willing to say to the rest of the church who's going rah, 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 now, now wait a second. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe it's true? In other words, there's a place in the, in the church, and I'm sure there is a place, especially in the Lutheran church, for people to be a little skeptical. I know that by nature we're kind of skeptical people. But sometimes it's a great thing to have permission, like Thomas, to ask the questions and to say, well, I am not sure. In other words, it might be okay for people when the words, he is risen, are spoken, he is risen. Oh, I caught you there, you missed it. He, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Who cares? Right? It's okay. 
okay to kind of say that? Who cares? Well, why would someone say, who cares? Well, we'd say, who cares? Because we've got our disappointments with God. And, and I don't know where you're at, but over the years, I and others have struggled with, with different disappointments. I've, I've listed them here, you know? How about a bad week? with coworkers or business colleagues? How about a struggling with chronic or emotional physical illness? How about we didn't uh, like how we just seem to be going around in circles this week? How about grief over someone who's died and whom we love or who is close to us? How about family disintegration? How about we just are late because we burned the toast this morning? Anything could kind of get us in that he is risen, who cares? Ah, oh, you missed it again. <laughs> he, you know, we can say, who cares? Is it true? Yeah, sure, it's true. Well, I suggest doubting Thomas, because I love him, because he's so, because so, he's so close to my heart, I suggest that he's a, he could be a patron saint for you, that if, if you have your doubts, because after all, it is in doubting that Thomas leads everyone to the greatest confession of the gospel. It's through his, his searching and his probing that he gets at the deepest meaning of who Jesus is. At the end of it, as I said, he confesses Jesus as my Lord and my God. We need more people like Thomas. And you know, our, our culture, of course, is oriented towards superheroes. Now, I, I do. I, I dutifully go to all the superhero movies when they come out. Although I haven't seen Captain America yet. If they have a review that after church, let me know. But, but I have noticed a shift that, that the heroes today, whether it be Superman, Batman, maybe Captain America, Iron Man, I forget who I'm missing here who's come out lately, they are people who are wrecked with doubt. They're unsure about who they are. They're unsure about their vocation. In a way, they reflect kind of the uncertainty of, of our times. But the difference is, still, that in our contemporary culture and mythology, they're still somehow invulnerable on some level. We know that, that uh, if they get socked in the jaw, they're going to just get right back up. If they get hit by a speeding wait, they're faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, that somehow they're going to get up and, and, and just rise up off the carpet. Not so with what we celebrated on Good Friday. We say, you know, Jesus, he has got all those superhero characteristics, but what does he do? He lays it all aside in order to be one of us completely. He gives his life for us on the cross Jesus says, you know, I could have used all my power, I could have commanded the angels, but how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Rather, he goes all the way to the cross for us. And of course, Easter is the surprise that's not the end of the story. Easter says that although Jesus has died, he's come back to life. And that means that that promise in the midst of our doubts is real. That Jesus, because he has risen from the dead, lives eternally, and we have the power in all our struggles, in all our doubts, in all our issues that we face in life. And I think, as I mentioned in the children's sermon, John, the Gospel of John, is suggesting to us that Christ appears most often in the community when two or three are gathered in his name. When we separate ourselves from the church, when we separate ourselves from the worshiping community, we run the risk of missing Jesus who shows up in a unique way. In such a unique way that every time we gather at this altar, he promises that he's going to be inside us. We say, take and eat, take and drink, this is for you. And Jesus goes out into the midst of all that mess I referenced. Martin Luther has this uh, great thing about what we're celebrating in communion. He, he perpetually dealt with doubts in his own life. And he, and he dealt with doubts in the life of the congregation. And he was coming out of a time period where people said, you know what, I can't go to the communion because I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I believe strongly enough. I'm not sure my life has been good enough. And Luther's response of, you know, if you're a doubter, if you're someone who's struggling, if you're someone who says, I don't know if I care, if you're someone who says, I'm not even sure if I have a heartbeat of faith, 
Don't walk to Holy Communion. Run. Run because you're going to meet Jesus there. Run because you're going to meet someone who's going to give strength to your weary bones. Run because you're going to be strengthened to go out and live a life of quiet victory under the cross, even in the midst of your doubts. I like how that's kind of conveyed in, in Jesus' um, life. How did the disciples recognize it's Jesus? How does he invite them to recognize that it really is he? I'm throwing that out. Feel free. I mean, how do they know? Yeah, by the wounds, right? He, he says, look, here they are. And, and I, I, I understand this. Uh, in American Sign Language, what's the symbol for Jesus? Does anybody remember? You put your hands like this. In other words, look at that. When you think about Jesus, think about the wounds. And that says maybe something about us and our doubts. When we, when we have doubts, when we have struggles, like Thomas, we can think about the wounds. Because Jesus has been wounded just like we have. And we can draw strength from his love and forgiveness. Have we ever been betrayed by somebody? Jesus has. Have we ever felt let down by our closest friends or by organizations? Jesus said, couldn't you support me in this one little hour? Have you ever been afraid to go on living but afraid to die? Jesus prayed like that in the garden. Father, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. Have you ever felt lonely and abandoned? Jesus says on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he doesn't so much berate us for doubts, but he invites us to place our doubts in his wounds especially as we come to the altar today in communion. I don't know who I got this quote from, but I think it, it really sums up um, the difference between that doubt is not the same thing as unbelief. Doubt is can't believe. Unbelief is won't believe. Doubt is honesty. Unbelief is obstinacy. Doubt is looking for light. Unbelief is content with darkness. Again, Jesus doesn't exhort us to have faith in faith. Rather, what he does is to say, touch and cling to me. And so we do, every day, and especially today. Amen.